part in this lesson uh, we're going to review what an inverse is and then we're going to look specifically at trig inverses. So recall uh, from a previous course, probably an algebra course, that if you had the function of anything, function, and you have some input that goes into your function and then you get some output, this could be a line or a quadratic or a rational function, then if you had the inverse of that, and that's how we denote it with a little negative one up there, if we put that output into the inverse, then we get out the original input. That's the relationship between a function and an inverse. I'm just going to write it slightly different. So x typically is our input. So if x goes in to some function, we'll call it f of x, I like to draw it in a little box, and then out comes some output, we'll call it y, if I then put y into the inverse function, then out comes the original input, which is x. And so we should erase that little piece right there, and we should denote y because that's the piece that we're putting in. Okay, so for trig, how does this relate to trig? Okay, so for trig, our input is normally arc length. So if I input some arc length, like pi over 4, into my function, into f of x, and some of our functions have been sine, cosine, let's just write them here a minute, sine, cosine, tangent, okay, so any one of those functions. So arc length goes in, and then what comes out, let's just pick sine for a minute, the sine of that arc length, and we call these things the functional values. Sine and cosines, tangents, are functional values. So now for my inverse, if I take the just a minute here. Get rid of these pieces. Alright, so now for my inverse, I'm going to put in the functional value. Functional value. That's going to go into the inverse function. And then out comes arc length. So that's what we're going to do with trig functions. So let's do an example a minute. So here's an example. I've got pi over 3, and I'm going to put that into the sine function. So in other words, I want the sine of pi over 3. And then just by looking at your circle, right, there's your circle. You look at your circle, and you see that when pi over 3 is your input, the sine or the output is square root of 3. Ooh, that's a goofy 3 square root of 3 over 2. Alright, so now for the inverse, I'm going to put in the square root of 3 over 2. That's going to go into the inverse function. And then out comes, again, I'm going to look at my circle and I'm going to say where is the sine square root of 3 over 2? And out comes pi over 3. And yes, we get a second one. We'll talk about that in a minute. So just kind of hold that thought. So um, first of all, a couple cautions here. So caution. All right, the sine to the negative 1, that's the inverse. This is not the reciprocal. Those two things do not mean the same thing. It's an inverse function. And something else to note that unlike in algebra, in trig, this inverse has a special name. It's sometimes called arc sine. So arc sine of x is the same thing as the inverse sine. Those two things mean the same things. And likewise with cosine, tangent, secant, cosecant, and cotangent. All right, so let's come back to this a minute here. Okay. So recall the definition of a function. So to be a function, that means you 
you have one input and you get out one and only one output. Now to be an invertible function that means one input and one and only one output and one output and one and only one input. And we sometimes call this a one to one function. One to one. One input in, one input out. For every input out, only one input in. All right, so now going back to that other one here. Let's go back to that one a minute. All right, so let me erase this bottom stuff. So when I did this first example with you, I said uh, if, if square root of 3 over 2 goes in, out comes pi over 3, and some of you might say, wait, wait, there's other places on the circle instead of just pi over 3, where the sign is the square root of 3 over 2, and that's 2 pi over 3, and that you're right. So what we're going to do now, and I'm going to do this in a separate video, we are going to talk about restricting domains. And we're going to do this so you only get one and only one output. So that's the end of this lesson.